人又夠鐘。二零一七年印花税修訂條例草案及二零一七年印花税修訂第二號條例草案委員會，咁而家個人又夠鐘就召開會議啦。Uh, 2017, and also、uh, stamp duty amendment number two, bill 2017. First, we have to confirm the、uh, chairman for this meeting. At the meeting,、uh, dated the 9th of June, members agreed that the bills committee set up to study. Stamp duty amendment bill 2017 should scrutinize stamp duty amendment number two bill 2017 as well, and to、uh, invite new members to join. Two new members, namely Mr. Eddie G and Dr. Junius Ho, have、um, applied to join the. B.C. and Mr. Felix Jung has withdrawn from the B.C. In other words, we have two new members, i.e., Mr. Eddie Chu and、uh, Dr. Junius Ho. Whereas Mr. Felix Jung has withdrawn from the membership. So, members, can we confirm that the name of、uh, this committee is the B.C. on? Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2017 and Stamp Duty Amendment Number Two Bill 2017. Okay. And the second thing to invite members to confirm is I myself as the chairman of the BC. And may I remind members that we completed the scrutiny of the stamp duty amendment bill 2017 at our last meeting dated the 13th of June. And members, please note the following dates. The administration intends to resume the second reading debate of the bill on the 12th of June sitting, and then I'm going to. Report to the House Committee on the twenty-third of June, and if members have any CSAs to move, please note that the deadline for giving notice is the third of July. Members, can I invite you to confirm? The name of、uh, this bill's committee. We have uh, uh, to add、uh, stamp duty amendment number two, bill 2017. No problem. And second,、uh, please、uh, confirm that I will continue to be the chairman of this bill's committee. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, agenda number two, agenda item number two. Please invite the administration to join us. I may I draw members' attention to ROP 83A in relation to disclosure of interest. If members have a direct or indirect pecuniary interest in the a matter under scrutiny, please remember to disclose the nature of the interest before you speak on the item. And if you already declare pecuniary interest in previous meetings, please remember to disclose once again before you speak for the first time in any meeting on the same matter. So please remember to disclose、uh, any pecuniary interest every time at the start of a meeting. So、uh, we have completed the scrutiny of stamp duty amendment bill 2017, and we're here to study stamp duty amendment number two bill 2017. I first invite the administration to brief us on the bill, and then I will open the floor to members for questions. Deputy Secretary,、uh, thank you, Chairman. 
Uh, the stamp duty amendment number two, Bill 2017, is relatively simple. Uh, since the introduction of the 15 percent on new residential development stamp duty, uh, it is noted that some transactions uh, cover multiple residential properties under a single instrument. And when we scrutinized uh, the first bill, members. Uh, raised a lot of concerns about this matter, and checking our data is found that um, there is a rising trend for the acquisition of multiple residential properties under a single instrument, and therefore we announced uh, on the 11th of April the tightening of uh, the uh, exemption arrangement with effect from the 12th of April 2017. So for a permanent resident of Hong Kong, uh, when he acquires one residential property under a single instrument, he is exempted from the um, NRSD. But if uh, there is more than one residential property under a single instrument, then he is not entitled to the exemption. We've briefed the reference panel a number of times that we've and we've considered how uh, the um, measure can be um, covered in a legislation, a piece of legislation. So we decide to do it in the new bill. As regards a single residential property, for most of the time it is easy to define, but there may be some not so straightforward cases. And so we have set up in the bill instruments that the ILD may take into account in deciding uh, whether uh, the um, uh, what constitutes a single residential property, and that can include approved building plans, deed of mutual covenant, occupation permits, and any other document that ILD considers relevant. Members reminded us that uh, there might uh, be cases uh, that have uh, to uh, be uh, sold together and considered a single residential property, and we've included some of the examples uh, in the bill, such as a unit and a roof situated immediately above the unit, a unit and an adjacent garden, and a unit that became a single unit following the demolition of the walls or any part of the walls, separating two adjoining units. And uh, we have uh, some uh, requirements on uh, what constitutes uh, uh, a single unit with the demolition of the walls. Before the announcement of the new measure, in March 2017, uh, the percentage uh, was 2.4 percent. The ratio of uh, uh, such cases to the total residential property transactions was 2.4 percent. Since the announcement of the measure, uh, it uh, um, fell back to uh, the uh, normal uh, situation, and that is 1.3 percent. And then uh, that is uh, the situation has resu resumed to more or less uh, the uh, normal situation before the introduction of RNSD, which was 0 0.5 percent. I pause here, and if members have questions, we'll be happy to take questions. Mr. James Till. Now, for uh, multiple residential properties under a single instrument, of course, uh, that should be targeted, and we are just looking at the details. But we have to consider the implications, and therefore, to play safe, I believe we should uh, conduct a public hearing. And secondly, For multiple residential properties transacted under a single instrument, 
uh, because uh, the government has changed uh, from its previous position. At first, uh, uh, there was some uh, disagreement as to whether uh, these were only individual cases. Now, because a single instrument can uh, cover uh, multiple residential properties, uh, you can't easily find a secondary uh, flat owner to uh, sell you such properties. Usually, it will be talk about uh, first-hand sales of properties. Now, in newly granted lease. Uh, will uh, conditions be uh, imposed to uh, restrict the uh, selling of properties in this manner? So it cannot uh, just be uh, dealt with uh, by paying NRSD because uh, uh, removing the exemption exemption of NRSD will only add to the transaction cost. So, have you considered other measures? To legally ensure that property developers will only sell um, properties one by one to prospective buyers. Will, will that be a more uh, fundamental solution? Of course, I'm not against uh, the measures in the bill. But do you think there are other measures you should adopt in parallel? Thank you. I think uh, Mr. James Toe is uh, um, referring to something um, similar to uh, restricting the number of uh, property that can be sold in one time. So the introduction of uh, uh, 15 percent NRSD is n uh, no small figure. This financial disincentive in the form of extra stamp duty uh, should be an appropriate measure to deter the the acquisition of more than one property. Do we have uh, to resort to more extreme measures uh, by uh, specifying in the lease that a buyer can only buy one uh, Single uh, first-hand property. So far, uh, we we don't see the need yet, but we we can review the situation later. Now, this is uh, what we learned uh, from uh, news and the uh, property section, and I don't know whether it is true or not. And uh, there are developers who would like to sell more than one flat to buyers. So even if you acquire one unit. A big discount is uh, offered usually by the developer to dilute the effect of uh, the 15 percent NRSD. <coughs> now, if a buyer is acquiring uh, the uh, uh, the first uh, property, he can save um, n times 15. Minus five, and um, developers are giving a big rebate to um, uh, their buyers. This bill will have retrospective effect. Have you consider whether developers have made arrangements to offset the effect of uh, the new measures in your bill? Yes. <coughs> Each developer, as for what discounts or rebates they offer, it's their commercial decision. We've noticed that even if developers offer any discounts or debates, they still attach conditions.
to them.、Um, it may be only available to、uh, people who、um, pay off the remaining amount in a certain mode or over a certain period of time. So not all buyers are entitled to the discounts or rebates. So whether that have an offsetting effect, I can't say because the offers, special offers, are not given to all buyers. As I just said, is that that we need to be more progressive or radical by limiting the number of flats local buyers can have. We think that the fifteen percent NRSD is already enough. Any other member? If not, then let me say a few words on the suggestion to have a public hearing. I found that this、uh, number two bill actually, well, it came after our scrutiny of the Stamped Amendment Bill, twenty seventeen. And、uh, we, most of our members, indeed, were concerned about the、um, situation of multiple residential properties being bought under one single instrument, and we urged the government in the、um, just scrutinized amendment bill to make. Changes to the content, but because there were differences in the long title, the government, as requested by members, set up a different bill. That is the number two bill to deal with the case of buying more than one residential properties under a single instrument. Therefore, I feel that the government. Because of members' request, and also because of the obvious public concern, it decided to make the amendment. If we were to hold a public hearing, members <coughs> is it because、um, people, all the people said that there should be the chance for multiple. Having multiple residential properties under one instrument, will we listen to those views? I think in order to, you know, to let our members have independent thinking on this issue, according to justice, and to enact laws with justice that may not be a necessity for public hearing. To to make sure that we are enacting laws according to justice. To enhance efficiency, I think that there's really no need on this particular amendment bill to hold a public hearing. But I'm open to members' views. Mr. Toll, okay, let me respond to your thinking. <coughs> I'm very surprised with what you said. Honestly, the number one amendment bill that we just looked at, there were lots of views. And the views were divided. Some thought that, you know,、um, held, held different views for, from many others. I think there should be a public hearing because not. I don't. Mean, I don't mean that we must listen to whatever views are expressed at the hearing, but the point is, ultimately, this is a technical bill and laws. Particularly for number one, after we're done with number one, Bill, and back then when we work on the bills, we didn't know that there would be the number two bill because the government resisted it for a long time. Well, I think when we scrutinized the previous bill, the government <coughs> made it very clear that they couldn't make further amendments to the number one bill. Therefore, they promised they would set up. A different bill, amendment bill. Yet that's what happened at a later stage. But it happened during the same scrutiny. Yeah, I'm saying that after the government's U-turn and the public and concerned parties, if they were to come 
here to express their views. There's there's still room. There should be room for them to tell us what they think, particularly for technical issues. I think there's a need for us to play safe. Okay, view taken. Even the the two lawyers' associations, uh, you know, on conveyancing, you know, documents. One meeting, say the Hong Kong Law Society has their own <coughs> convenience committee. They may not say anything if they see no problem with the um, provisions in the law. Understood. But I'd like to hear from other members. Holden Chow. Thank you, Chairman. I think that, well, just then I heard Chairman's your view, and I feel that. On this stem to amendment number two bill, if I remember correctly, on the scrutiny of the number one bill, quite a number of members had said that the question of multiple residential properties under uh, one instrument could be a loophole. They used the word loophole. So my memory is that quite many members thought that to plug the loophole. We need to plot the loophole. Therefore, the government should make further amendments in the law. So time has passed, and by now we have with us the number two bill, and because of that, we're meeting here today. So, given what you said, the cha chairman, that members on the whole, or even Members mostly thought that we should plug the loophole, and now we are left with this number two bill. We, I think, we should act on it ASAP. So I also think that there may not be a need for public hearing to deal with the matter. I heard Mr. Toe's views as well that. Maybe the two lawyers associations may have their concerns about the provisions, but look at it the other way. If the two lawyers associations have views, well, I'm new to this committee and the council. So if we don't hold a public hearing, but can we instead ask the two lawyers associations to give us their written submissions? So look at it the other way. I think that if we have a consensus already on plucking the loophole, then that's what we should do. So there may not be a need, however, for a public hearing. You know, different bills have different concerns and arrangements. So if we are actually um, determined to pluck the loophole, then we should get it done as soon as possible. Mr. Toll. Chairman. I very much hope to convince members. I have scrutinized many bills myself. If members think that there should be a public hearing, honestly, even I myself, even if I don't think there is a need, I wouldn't block other members from proposing one. Mr. To, I wouldn't agree with the word blocking. You are expressing your views, and others are entitled to their views. You can't say that members are trying to block your view. Well, I'm just telling you my experience. I, I'm responsible for the wordings I use. But excuse me, I like to use the word block. Well, there's no such thing as blocking. But well, you can say that in your time. But I'm using my time now. My experience is that if a member suggests a public hearing, even if I didn't think there's a need for it. In the past, I think rarely did it happen in the past that um, the proposal for a public hearing would be rejected. If you say that, okay, even even the members are inclined towards a certain view, we can still hear the views of the sector, the lawyers associations, or even op opposing views, or maybe new views. This. Multiple residential properties under one single instrument. There could be organizations with uh, views, other views, alternative views. All these amendment number one, number two bill, they are intended to, you know, 
for people who are speculators, the people who don't really need the flats, or buyers with a pent up demand. We try to suppress the demand for flats. I think I need to set a time limit now, because not only you needs the time, Chairman. From the start, I didn't. You were saying you are using your time. I'm using my time. But I didn't say that we shouldn't set a time limit. But when I was speaking, couldn't you have been more patient? When we started the meeting, you have taken up the most time so far, but nobody else raised their hands. Chairman, can you? Would you not let the chairman speak? But you can speak when you, it's your turn. You want to set the time limit, then you can do that. But you don't disrupt me and then say that there's a time limit. Don't disrupt me. I never disrupted you. You interrupted me too. Well, I never did. I never did. Chairman, you call my name and then I start to speak. Why don't you make all the fuss here? No, I never. I didn't. Okay, tell me the time limit. How much time do I have? I can queue up again. All right. Start again, please. I hope that members understand that, after all, this is something technical, and not all the lawyers' associations would have their technical concerns. Even in the past, you know, when the um, stamp duties and draconian measures were, put, were put introduced, many in the sector, maybe they have interests involved, but they have technical viewpoints which we need to address. They may actually um, make things difficult by um, citing technical concerns, but we need to know what are the technical issues. But if there are no problems, then we can rest assured that the bill is enforceable. So we are responsible when scrutinizing the number two bill to urge the administration, for example, or to remind government of what they need to be mindful of. Otherwise, there could be other loopholes still around. Any other supplements? No? Okay, next one. Alice Mack. Chairman, I want to know about the time, the time frame. Well, we had the first public hearing some time ago. I think we were all there, and back then the government uh, had not um, moved to a man um, to accommodate the concern over multiple residential properties under one single instrument. So the administration now um, has incorporated it. But what about the time frame? That is, if we finish the scrutiny smoothly, is it possible for us to pass the law in the logical term, this logical term? Well, time is tight. I think, as I just said, if we can finish the scrutiny today, then I hope that within I hope that within the logical term, before the end of the logical term, we can submit it to the House Committee, and then on July 12th, we can try to have a second reading in the Council. Is that possible, Secretary? Now, uh, please, a speech on microphone for the Secretary. Uh, thank you. If I as suggested by the chairman, with the agreement of uh, members, and if uh, and of course, uh, Mr. James Toe uh, suggested uh, a public hearing and uh, to see whether there are the views. Well, uh, it is up to the BC to decide to do it or not, and. And uh, if we can uh, complete uh, the Q and A's, and if we have completed the uh, scrutiny of uh, the bill, then I think it might be possible to proceed as uh, 
described by the chairman. But uh, we haven't uh, done a close by close scrutiny yet, and the legal advisor or um, both uh, members and or the administration may uh, have um, supplement and uh, whether uh, we can uh, beat the deadline uh, depends very much on the uh, uh, efficiency of uh, this BC. Now, if we cannot do it on the 12th of June, we have uh, to wait until uh, we come back uh, in October. Will this uh, affect uh, the... No, no, this is uh, negative vetting. Well, yes, uh, although the measures took effect on the 12th of April, the ILD cannot uh, collect the stamp duty yet. It can only register all the relevant cases and uh, can only uh, handle these cases after the bill is enacted. From the administration's point of view, uh, the earlier the bill is enacted, the better. Uh, to allow more time for the uh, ILT to work, but of course that is subject to the progress of the BC. So if we come back uh, in October before we can do it, that means uh, there will be uh, a backlog of cases starting from April, right? I always feel that it's good to uh, listen to views of the public, to listen to the views of the public, but uh, we have a time problem here. We already had a public hearing uh, in the uh, last uh, bill, so if we can complete the bill within uh, this legislative session, then uh, let's not conduct a public hearing so that we can be efficient. But if in as we scrutinize the bill, if members have a lot of questions, our legal advisor has a lot of views, and if we uh, can't uh, really uh, do it within this uh, legislative session, then let's wait until we come back in October. Mr. James Toe, I've considered this point as well. Well, I uh, don't think there is any problem from the perspective of protection of government revenue because all the cases are already registered. And uh, the buyers, anyway, uh, cannot um, abscond. So as for the bad lock of cases, in fact, since the, intro since the announcement of uh, the new measure, According to the administration, while there are still uh, cases of multiple residential properties acquired into a single instrument, the number has uh, dwindled, so uh, then aren't too many uh, cases really. Of course, our target is to enact the bill ASAP, but uh, because a major legal principle is involved. In the past, the administration claimed that uh, stamp duty uh, was considered uh, based on a single instrument. Now, uh, this multiple residential properties under a single instrument is an exception and is a precedent. So I think it is safer if we uh, try to be meticulous, even if we have a public hearing. We just uh, wait for the administration to uh, respond to those submissions, and then we have another meeting to uh, consider the CSAs. We only talk about an additional couple of meetings, but this will uh, uh, show to the public uh, that um, the way we scrutinize uh, the bill is uh, very safe and are reliable. And if there are speculators out there uh, deciding to uh, continue to buy in this manner because uh, they uh, query whether LACHCO would pass the bill or not. Now, there was some objection to uh, the first bill, but for this one, there is no one who opposed uh, this bill in principle. I'll not name. Um, political parties, but there were uh, political parties who opposed the first bill, but now we don't hear any objection. So it's quite likely that speculators uh, out there would abuse the system. 
thinking that the bill might not be passed by the council. So I don't think uh, we have really um, compromised any uh, major um, legal principles or uh, cause any loophole. Anything more? Anything more, uh, Mr. Holden Chow? Thank you, Chairman. This number two bill is mainly here to pluck the loophole involving acquisition of multiple residential properties under a single instrument. So uh, the uh, bill would only commence after all the legislative process is over. Can I put it this way? This loophole still exists so long as the bill is not passed in this council. Am I correct in describing it this way? Yes. Well, to be uh, exact, the next day when uh, the arrangement was announced on the 11th of April 2017 already took effect. However, we need formal approval by LegCo. So, um, uh, since uh, the bill is not yet enacted by the council, uh, it is not really 100%. So, for our uh, previous demand side management measures, we wanted to um, complete the legislative process as soon as possible. By way of background, Uh, for uh, the um, for amendment bill uh, 2017, uh, we felt or uh, the legal advice we got was that uh, the scope will not allow us to move a CSA to uh, tackle property acquisitions under a single instrument. We didn't do it. So uh, for this bill, we is here all because of that, and it is because of that technical problem that uh, we have to do it in a more cumbersome way by means of a number two bill. Chairman, as the dear said, as long as the legislative process is not complete, then, well, let me put it uh, straight. Uh, frankly, uh, there is still a loophole or a risk or, or a defect, as claimed by the DS. Now, this bill is obviously different from the uh, last one. Number two bill is plainly introduced to tackle the loophole whereby multiple residential properties are acquired under a single instrument. I think uh, this is in response to the wish of uh, many people in the community. Now, outsiders may uh, acquire 10 or 20 residential properties under a single instrument, and that is uh, one man uh, can monopolize uh, the supply. I think uh, this is a loophole uh, which uh, Hong Kong people don't want to see. So the bill is meant to pluck this loophole. Since it is already introduced, uh, we should proceed as soon as possible. So long as the legislative process is not complete, uh, that is the possibility of uh, defect. So. Uh, because we want to uh, pluck the loophole, and I don't want this uh, defect to exist uh, from day one. And uh, many of us were present at the last hearing, and I, I, from what I can recollect, uh, 
a lot of uh, deputations or individuals mentioned the loophole of uh, acquiring multiple residential properties under a single instrument. So a uh, hearing was already held for the first bill, and I think we should pluck this loophole and uh, uh, leaving uh, no um, defect. We should uh, complete the bill ASAP. Of course, I understand Mr. James Toe's point. He uh, wants to uh, listen to the views of uh, members of the public and professional bodies. I think I agree to that. Can we just uh, ask uh, or invite views from the two law uh, uh, legal bodies, Mr. James Toe? In fact, I am uh, the most. Uh, anxious among members to pluck this loophole. A few years ago, I was the first uh, to uh, to um, suggest this, and I was rather happy, unhappy. I um, took the secretary to task to force him to um, face up to this problem. So I am very anxious about this matter. But then, as soon as the Measure was announced. Uh, it already took effect, although it's not hundred percent. But as said by the chairman, if there are people out there to a uh, gamble uh, on uh, the bill and not accepted by council, then uh, let them take the risk. I think we cannot imagine uh, how likely that's going to be. And as for public hearing, now for Amendment uh, Number One Bill is from uh, five to fifteen percent. We held a public hearing on that, and the government's position was against uh, uh, tackling multiple residential properties under a single instrument, and many uh, deputations supported uh, the. Um, Inclusion of multiple residential properties under a single instrument, and um, those are remarks or views were made without uh, knowledge of the government's new position. So I beg members to um, consider the following: You're quite sure that uh, the bill can be passed. When uh, we have the bill in front of us, why don't we listen more carefully to the views of uh, the public and uh, other parties to ensure that the bill is comprehensive? Is it really that, that difficult to have another public hearing? I uh, beg members to allow the public a chance, another chance to comment on this bill. And as for um, protection of public revenue, uh, the, the measure has already taken effect. I really see, I really see a proposal to hold a public hearing uh, to be rejected because of the time factor. Now we don't need. It's not that we have to legislate urgently to tackle a financial crisis or a, a, a crisis in our financial system. So I urge members to uh, be patient and allow a public hearing to be held. Any other questions? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, tender my views to you for your consideration. Amendment number two, Bill. Is here uh, because of views expressed by deputations, the community, and members when we scrutinized the first amendment bill and the administration in response to um, such aspirations has re responded promptly. It wanted to move CSAs to the first bill to. Uh, introduce this measure, but uh, the scope of the first bill didn't allow that, and that's why we have a number two bill. Should we have an other public hearing? 
I don't think this is a crucial matter. We can always、uh, consult the public any time. We can do that. Be it later or sooner. But the fact is, we are very busy in the con in this council. We are all very busy. So we are actually attending several meetings at the same time.、So、our meetings are scheduled from the morning to the evening, non-stop. So, and、um, as、um, now we're near the end of the logical term. If we cannot finish our business. Then we won't be able to pick it up again till several months after the because of the break. So because of the time involved. Now that we are going to have negative fatting, then many cases. Well, you are a lawyer, you know. When you want to buy a property, the lawyers are obliged. To、uh, collect the stamp duty first and place it in the law firm until after the law is passed to pass it to the Inland Revenue Department. So the law firms are accountable, and the Treasury and the Inland Revenue Department are looking forward to getting the stamp duty, and if we Lachco, as a legislative body, can do our work efficiently and fast enough. Then it's not just about the public hearing, but well, it's easy to hold a public hearing. What's the problem with having a public hearing here? No problem, but because of all the circumstances、I、just mentioned. There are no political disputes here. We're just trying to do our job here. So, Mr. To, I hope that you try to convince me, but I also want to convince you too. Is it necessary to have the hearing? Well, that's what my, I wanted to say. I hope you can consider my opinion, Mr. To. Chairman, I'm not going to repeat myself. I think what upsets me most is the administration. When I heard the administration say they wanted to have it passed through CSA, but legal advice said that because of a long title, we couldn't do that for the number one bill. Chairman, I couldn't believe that's what the administration said. All along, it had opposed. Plucking the loophole of、uh, multiple residential properties under one single instrument. The administration had never said that it wanted to pass the bill in July. That's only the view of some members. But the administration hinted that,、uh, well, in response to、uh, Ho Dan Chao, it says that there are some flaws there. But if you wanted to pluck the loophole long ago, you would have incorporated it in the number one bill. You didn't do that, and right in the middle, you made a U-turn. Then you should have given people the time to think about the change. So why would the administration say that if not, we would have、uh, have it passed through CSA? How can the government say that? I think, Chairman, you need to be fair. And secondly, Justin Chairman made the viewpoint that. Let me respond to it. You said that there will be a gap of several months because of the summer break, but for some legislation, let me give you some example. I scrutinize some bills which are as thick as a telephone book. You want to, you know, finish it in one go. If not, then you know you need to refresh your memory if you have to have a summer break. But this is this bill is a very simple bill. It's not like those lengthy bills. 
even if we were to come back to look at it after the break, after a few months, you can pick up the key points very easily. Unlike the lengthy bill, where if you want to catch up after a break of several months, and you find that you have to recall so many information, and that would delay the whole process. But that won't happen to this short bill. Therefore, even having a public hearing, or even if we have to pick it up again in October, we can come back to our work very easily, and it won't be that like during July and October, of during the break, we have to、uh, read through the a long bill before we can pick up the pieces again. So I hope that members can think about it, that、uh, whether they can support my idea for a public hearing. I'm. I'm one of the members who really want to see this bill passed, but I still feel that, you know, you want to play safe, right? So that we could, there could be areas that we've overlooked. For example, some technical issues. We're not just talking about concerns by the lawyers' association, the like,、um, property agents, could be affected. You know, we can talk about the inclusion of、uh, roofs or car park parking spaces and so forth. So, property agents may have their concerns. So, in CS, sorry, not CSA, but during our clause by clause scrutiny, if we have had a hearing, we will be able to identify any key areas. Any follow up points? Just then, Mr. Toll said that、um, to what the administration's response, he had reservations. But of course, members are here to monitor the government's introduction of laws and on government measures. We are supposed to deliver views on them and monitor the government's work. That's. Actually, the effects of logical members. I think we have. How can we perform our duties and make sure the government would look pluck loopholes by taking on board our opinions? But we actually supposed to fulfill those duties. So members and you know work that way, and that's the relationship between the executive and legislative branches. So you. It's the normal way. You don't need to lose your temper. Of course, this bill is not complex. I think, with your experience in scrutinizing bills, is just a piece of cake. You know, compared to competition laws, which are four books all together, the company ordinance is so thick, right? Kenneth Lang, right? You were involved in scrutinizing that piece of legislation, right? Laws from the SFC, so thick. I'm not talking about so much about calling back memory when we come back in October. I'm only hoping to deal with this bill efficiently and fast. So. Do we need to have a hearing if we want to have it passed quickly? The number two bill, indeed, came about because of a request that came in the wake of a public hearing. So, if we dwell on this issue, then basically we will have wasted a lot of time. We haven't started our clause by clause scrutiny. So, two views. Okay, let's put aside the public hearing. Let's go straight to the scrutiny. We need to see during our scrutiny whether there could be doubts, which actually、um, result in the fact that we can't finish our work before the lunch call recess. So let's not take up any more time. Because we don't want to. Well, if we have this bill delayed till the next legislative term, I won't mind having public hearings then. But if our scrutiny goes on smoothly, then we can submit it to House Committee and then the Council, and then we can finish it in this legislative term. That would be ideal. 
So, I would put aside the controversy over the public hearing. And secondly, or another solution is, members, you're welcome to deliver your views. Take a vote. We can take a vote on public hearing. So, members, what do you think? Mr. To? I think we need to decide now whether to have a hearing. Why? Because, as I just said, have a hearing for this bill. Well, there could be still people who are opposed to the amendment, and of course, no one knows whether any members would be convinced by them. But when it comes to technical issues, I really want to listen during the hearing views concerning any technical concerns, so that when we do the scrutiny, we can play safe. So I do think that there should be a hearing before we start the scrutiny. Mr. To, well, you and I have spent much time here, three minutes, four minutes, by a deputation. On the contrary, I would rather uh, you know, written submissions, reading written submissions from the two lawyers' associations, which are more detailed. Professional opinions submitted, but during hearing, public hearing, each one speaks three or four minutes. I they wouldn't say much on an individual basis. Yes, we can collect all the opinions during hearings. Well, we we're not just uh, listening for three four minutes from each party and or just from the lawyers associations. Often, they were all in the past. Uh, there were associations who could write three to uh, four to five pages of submissions, and um, they really make thought provoking comments. And for some associations in the past, I did make made appointments with them to try to to get them to explain through a lawyer to me what they were trying to get at. So it's not about the three or four minutes each deputation has at the hearing, even if they don't submit. Return submissions. You know, in this world, you know, in this world, the internet world is full of talents. We well, understand what you're saying. Okay. So, based on your opinion, this this is pointless doing the scrutiny because we need to have a public hearing first, right? So that means we need to adjourn now, right? If you know, if based on what you said, because you, if we were to have a public hearing, we can't begin the scrutiny today. Yeah, that's what I hope. In other words, that means uh, we need to adjourn now. Well, if members have no other questions, I, I still have one or two other questions. I still have one or two other questions of principle. But may I know? However, can we decide today whether we'll have a public hearing or not? Holden Chang. Thank you, Chen. Of course, I understand Mr. Toll's point, but I'd like to ask the Secretary, Secretariat, because you're more experienced. In the past, in the clause by clause scrutiny stage, is it Necessary that say if uh, members feel there should be a hearing that we must have a hearing first before we do the scrutiny or as the chairman said can we have the scrutiny first and then have the hearing and after hearing after we've heard some views we can go back to uh, the provisions or propose changes to provisions is that possible you know I'm not that experienced myself. So that's the only question I have. According to Peru 2.4 of the procedures for Bill's committee, uh, before uh, scrutinizing the clause, uh, whether a uh, public hearing uh, should be done before a uh, clause by cross scrutiny or whether the two can be done together, uh, there is no convention. 
It is、uh, for individual bills committees to decide. So that's what in the、uh, rules. So we、uh, do not have any rule on、uh, having a public hearing first、uh, before we do other things. So it's just、uh, it's entirely for the bills committee to decide whether there should be an.、Uh, A、uh, public hearing, and if so, when? Mr. James, do you say to you had a couple of、uh, questions on the matter of policy? Since uh, uh, we had we have had such a long debate on that, then can we make a decision first? I suggest we don't make a decision now.、Uh, we do it towards the end of our meeting. Okay, I have a question on paragraph six, six and eight, in fact. Acquisition of a single residential property with or without one car parking space under a single instrument, and、uh, the ILD may take into account various documents in making that decision. So I'd like to ask whether, as a matter of principle. You will allow the IRD quite a big discretion. Can we put it this way? Now, if it is a single resident pro residential property and it must、uh, be exempted, or, for instance, if on the occupation permit.、Uh, They are two individual units. Will、uh, this、uh, lead to、uh, controversies? Yes. When we say a single residential property, using common sense, one is one, but as mentioned by members. Uh, in some circumstances, the、uh, situation is not that clear cut, and when there are ambiguities, the IRD may take into account all relevant documents in making that decision, and they can include approved building plans, deed of mutual covenant, and occupation permit. Uh, usually, uh, it's relatively easy to define a single residential property, and in in case there are grey areas, we hope to allow the IRD to take into account all relevant documents before making a decision. And in fact, IRD will、um, take into account various documents when there are arguments. Now, I think、uh, Mr. James Toh is talking about.、Uh, Para six with or without one car parking space in 2013, when、uh, the ad valorem、uh, stamp duty was first introduced, there was an amendment made. Now, if you're Hong Kong PR, when you purchase a residential property with one car parking space, well, uh, that uh, he he he's entitled to that exemption on the basis that he doesn't own another property. So、um, when we quote examples, we、uh, usually、uh, quote other common examples without referring to、uh, car parking space, because at present, uh, uh, Hong Kong PR buying a single residential unit plus a car parking space is already exempted. All right,、uh, you are clear about. The situation where it is a single residential unit plus a car parking space. What are other grey areas or、um, unclear cases you can think of to the effect that ILD can、uh, use its discretion by referring to other documents? So, can you、um, give examples of uh, some uh, common unclear cases and make them clear? Uh, some members referred to 
pre-war tenement buildings where uh, the situation is not clear and as a result the IRD may have to uh, take into account various documents before making a decision and otherwise we believe uh, using common sense it is easy to define whether it is a single property However, uh, we would allow uh, ILD uh, the discretion to consider other relevant documents in making a decision. Mr. Tam from ILD, it's not that we have uh, common unclear cases. We'll talk about uh, common cases uh, which uh, prima facie uh, may not appear to be a single unit but can still be acceptable after referring to various documents. For instance, a unit in the roof situated immediately above the unit. So we have added various documents that the IRD may take into account as to cover uh, things that we might not be able to um, exhaust here. We will allow another uh, layer of flexibility for the director to uh, handle cases that cannot be uh, foreseen here. So just to give extra flexibility. Dr. Edward Yu, can I uh, give you a real example? If you look at 29A, definition of a single residential unit uh, and uh, two adjacent units approved by the uh, director of uh, the building authority. And uh, for reference documents, you include the MC. Now, uh, there's a Chief of Garden versus uh, Cho Raymond. BA's approval was granted to demolish a wall in between two units and uh, is already a joint unit. However, the DMC was not clear, so the final ruling by the court was uh, because of the existence of structural walls within the unit, uh, the a case was ruled to be against a DMC and therefore the wall could not be demolished. So in reality, they are really very complicated cases. The reason I quote this case is uh, the IRD may think that, well, uh, there's approval by the uh, BA and therefore the two can be regarded as uh, two adjoining units. But then the court may rule that it's against the DMC. Now, in the first case, uh, exemption from um, NRSD uh, was granted. And will you have a mechanism to deal with such a case? Now, uh, for two adjoining units with the uh, wall in between demolished, we have consulted the buildings department. Oh, ASD, or rather uh, BD, buildings department. Prior approval by the building authority may be needed. So we've made it very clear. First, uh, there must be approval by the BA first. And uh, if the walls are pulled down according to approval, there should be an AP of authorized persons certificate. And then there must be acknowledgement by the BA and all three steps have to be completed before two adjoining units can be regarded as one. And in some cases, a demolition of the walls may not require prior approval. When that's the case, we will require an AP to confirm that the works have been completed. And for the AP, uh, we are talking about those on the list in uh, held by the BD. 
Dr. Yu asked her whether there would be conflicting documents in the same case, and that's exactly why the ILD has to consider various documents and cannot just refer to one document. For instance, uh, when uh, uh, the building plans may show that they were two buildings, but uh, there might be late documents to show that the two adjoining units have become one. So, and that's why the ILD has to take into account all relevant documents before making a decision. As regards the court case Dr. Yu referred to, I'm not too familiar with it, but uh, the ILD will have to consider all various documents. My question is, you've already made a judgment, and what if it is contradictory to a uh, court decision, and the uh, person concerned may apply for a refund, or you uh, may try to recover the um, undercharged stamp duty. Will this happen? Uh, Mr. Tam, are you aware of that case? Uh, I'm not too uh, f sure uh, what the case referred to by Ms. Uh, Dr. Yu is about, but assuming we have two adjoining units, and there are uh, two units under the DMC, but if uh, the owner has fulfilled all the requirements, that is, approval by the BA and a certification uh, by an AB to uh, confirm that the walls have been dem demolished, and if these requirements are fulfilled, then we would accept that the two adjoining units are one, even though the court subsequently ruled that the walls could not be demolished. Will you stick to your original decision? All right, if uh, there is a court ruling contradictory to your earlier decision, how will you deal with that case? We will consider the uh, status as at the date of acquisition, but if indeed uh, there is such a case, we will have to uh, study the details first. Mr. Holden Chow, now at this point, uh, there is a risk. If I may put it uh, uh, more um, in a more uh, straightforward manner, all right. I have two adjoining units in the DMC. Assuming that I have removed the walls to turn them into one. Here, you say that uh, there must uh, be a letter issued by the BA acknowledging receipt of a certificate of completion of the works. Now let's assume that the owner has not adhered to the requirements strictly. The walls have been pulled down and uh, he cannot get the certificate or acknowledgement issued by the BA. When uh, the transaction took place, he only uh, paid them duty as if it were one unit. And then for whatever reason, uh, the um, factor was revealed or exposed. Because according to a DMC, uh, they are two units, but I breached the rules. I uh, demolished the walls. Will you uh, recover? The extra NRSD. And, uh, oh, now what about uh, illegal partitioned units? There is only one unit, but I subdivided into various units, which is against the law. So uh, instead of one, I have four units, and I sell the uh, 
subdivided units to four different buyers. So uh, they're supposed to uh, pay uh, stamp duty for each unit. Then, uh, in fact, uh, there should be uh, only a normal stamp duty chargeable on this transaction, but or perhaps the government might be overcharging because there will be four transactions. Now, uh, the government has no, or the IRD has no professional knowledge to judge uh, whether it is a unit or two. It makes its decision on the basis of documents it have. So, if uh, the walls in between two adjoining units are demolished, then it is up to the buyer to submit documentary proof. It would either be um, acknowledgement from BA or maybe no approval by the BA is required. Still, we want approve we want building plans signed by an AP. So the Inland Review Department has to look at the documents first before deciding whether the wars are really demolished and whether the premises should be treated as one single property. They wouldn't just um take the um taxpayers' word for it without any evidence. So they need to see the evidence first. And for the collection of stamp duty, it's the amount collected when the document is stamped. So therefore, it depends on who or the um, buyer, what sorts of documents can be produced by the buyer. And uh, after the stamping is done, I think unless it's a very extreme example, where well, that could be forced all sorts of strange examples, but normally speaking, it really is dependent on you know the situation when a document is stamped and what sorts of documents are produced to get perhaps an exemption whether um a property is considered as a single one or not okay we've still got some time I understand so in other words the um, buyer should provide clear documents. If they cannot produce clear documents, then um, all the documents needed, then he shouldn't blame people or, or the government for extra tax. Well, I have some views on, for example, um, subdivided flats. You know, the point made by Hoden Chow on subdivided flats, how can there be... Um, you know, actually, you mean subdivided, subdivided, subdivided flats being sold as separate units? Can we have um, actually uh, documents for them? Yes. And also, you said that uh, if someone demolishes a wall without proper approval, that would be like illegal construction. Following up on what um, Houghton Chow just mentioned, before the um, introduction of the additional stem, stem duty, well, after the introduction of the stem duty, you can only buy one property at a time, and um, if you buy more than one, then you're entitled. You need to pay the fifteen percent. Next one, James Toll. Chairman, actually, I have a similar concern as uh, Edward knew. Right now, to be frank, we want to avoid, you know, a scenario where a developer, uh, you know, doing that, we try to plug the loophole of uh, multiple residential properties under one single instrument, and uh, the developer may have egg flats on the floor, okay, with their own entrance, individual entrance to each flat on the floor, and but his plan, say, next to, uh, for example, flat or between, in between flat A and B, um, he removed the walls and in between them, and he got actually uh, an um, occupation 
permit to them. Assuming that someone put a, a B on the floor and the occupation permit covers seven flats and the flat city F G H comprise six flats, that means he's buying one unit. So looking at the occupation permit, it shows that he's got seven flats. My question is, can he, will he be regarded as uh, getting one property under one single instrument? Because I think on this issue, it, it is very important. It, it's, it's very important to the bill, this sort of issue. You t you're you saying that a developer colluded with a buyer? That is in the, because the developer could change the plan before the uh, occupation permit was issued. Say so A, A, B are supposed to be two units, but if you remove the wall in between the units, then that could be um, treated as one unit. And when he applied for the app, uh, occupation permit, A, B becomes one unit, and C, D, E, F are separate units. Because when the person buy the property, you when he bought the property, that he could be regarded as one property under one instrument because that's one unit with the wall removed. So that's a loophole. But I don't know, you know, how, which law could pluck this sort of loophole. So I'd like to ask you: Would you regard it as one unit? The example that I just gave. Therefore, the uh, Indian Revenue Department has to look at all relevant documents. I told you that what the documents are. If that unit itself, A and B, two units, if they say that they removed a wall in between to make it one unit, then that's one unit. Be the, I don't know. I don't know what's written in the OC and uh, OP and the Deed of Mutual Covenant. I would need to look at what is written in the DMC and what is that in the occupation permit. We need to. I can't tell you uh, the answer until I've read the document. But given what you said, the uncertainty is too great. Then that makes it very dangerous for us to pass the law. So excuse me for saying this. Let me explain. I'll give you two more cases. I really want you to really uh, address all these various scenarios. Another possibility. So use Houghton Charles example. I know this is not common, but let me give you this as an example. In Takok Choi, there's so many old buildings. Unit A on fourth floor, for example, 800 square feet is subdivided into four flats sold to four different people, four owners there. But, well, maybe the developer you know, in they wanted to uh, take over this old building, but he didn't want to ask a. He didn't want to get the units individually from the four owners. He instead he asked them to sell sell their their um, deeds to them. So owners A sold their deeds to the buyer. The deed of mutual covenant and the occupation permit, A, B, C, D together, it, they comprised only one unit because back in 30 years ago they were one unit. And yet now he bought four deeds, even though actually the, the same deed actually covers four units. So would you regard that as multiple residential properties under one document or not and charge them 15%? You understand what I was saying, right? I don't know whether the IRD can respond immediately. I know there are also sort of odd cases, and I may not be able to give you the answer right away. But Mr. Tam, could you help? These are 
odd cases. I think we need to think through these cases first before giving you an answer. So, Chairman, okay, you can think about them. Oh, sorry, I'll queue up again. Nobody's in the queue. Okay, you have actually spoken over time. I think we need to prevent loopholes, and also we need to make sure that we need to be careful with not being accused of going too far. Okay, using the first example, the unit A and B with their war in between demolished, and then the uh, deeds becomes number of this becomes seven in the end. The subsequent act say if the war is reinstated afterwards then say the unit is sold to in the subsequently sold to two people. Okay, sold to A persons A and B for unit A and B. So it's like Similar to the tackle tree example, say in the tackle tree building is 800 square feet initially with one owner. Now it's divided into four units with four owners, and then the new unit A B now with the world reinstated um, subdivide. There are two subdivided flats in the. Well, I don't know whether this is a luxury. We can call it luxury flat or not, but the people who bought the unit A and unit B. Well, the chances are low that people will buy them, but when they do buy the two units, then that will become an issue of subdivided flats. Say ten years later, five years later. Okay, when they sold the um, units as two units, subdivided flats, then I need to be careful here. Where does the certainty lie? It's I think what is certain is what's written in the occupation unit a permit. But of course, the developer would uh, build larger flats. But ultimately, well, if they rent out a flat, uh, a big flat for one person, then that's fine. But if years later, in order to avoid a tax, they Turn the luxury flat into subdivided flats. I mean, the chance of that happening is very slim, but no one knows what will happen in the future. I heard that on the peak, there are the subdivided flats being uh, available for rental at twenty thousand a month because a large uh, flat divided into very smaller units. I heard on the peak now. So I think, but you need to be certain. You know about what we mean, and to avoid future lawsuits. So, administration, do you understand, Mr. Toe's the scenario was mentioned by Mr. Toe. You know, I'm a bit confused, lost now, but but so my understanding is like for a flat, A, B, C, D, four units on the floor, new flats, all new flats, and a new building. And the developer um, removes the warp in between units A and B, so that so it becomes uh, the unit B is gone. So just A, C, D, three units. A buyer buys the large A unit as one property, right? So he bought it for the first time, so he is exempted the fifteen percent stamp duty, only five percent only, right? Yes, and then. So for occupation permits. So in this case, but he bought the, but he removed the wall through after, uh, by following proper procedures. So B is gone. Unit B is gone with the wall gone, right? So the problem is the large, the larger A unit would it be considered as one property or not, and and be exempted from the stamp duty? Is my understanding correct? You need to ask her. Yeah, my understanding of your point. Yes, it's my understanding of your scenario. Yes, I think your understanding of my point. My point is wrong, because if there are four occupation permits, and just remove 
the if they just removed the wall, I think the property considered the large property should be con should be considered as uh, one property with two units. I want some certainty. So A, B, C, D are they regarded as uh, two units or four units? So are they one unit? Are they regarded as one or two units? And the second question by Mr. To is, uh, there is an old, no, no, that's my third question. That's my third question. All right, we will deal with them one by one. All right. Uh, old buildings are bigger in size and very often they are made into subdivided units. Now, I've also, uh, I might have such uh, old buildings. You have to declare interest. But uh, I, I, I am not uh, selling them, so there is no uh, pecuniary interest. Now, uh, for subdivided units, they, they appear uh, more than uh, 20 years ago. So all four units. Can, can the lease be uh, divided into four units for uh, sale to a uh, different uh, to different buyers? Uh, will lawyer do that for me? Yes, you, they 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 will do it. I think the ILD knows. For example, it's called undivided shares. All right, there are five undivided shares. So. Is split into four units. When A1 is sold, that is uh, one quarter of one flat A. Flat A. All right, there is only one unit and uh, five undivided shares. And A1, A2, A3, four, four units are sold. Each own a joint and several one quarter of the five shares. That's how these units are sold. Oh. And then A one is a pa is a painted blue for instance. So uh the uh, S four SDUs are sold to uh, four different buyers. And if a buyer uh, purchased uh, purchase all four units for uh, own occupation or or whatever, so all four units are sold. So uh, is that uh, one single unit or four multiple units? So is it said four multiple four units or one unit? All right, is it four units or one unit? So that's the second question. All right. Another question is now another scenario is there are seven units in the uh, deed. So A flat A. So uh, according to DMC and also the OP, it is really one unit. Would you regard it as one unit or two units? And then if there are eight units under the deed and then the walls are removed, so A and B are bought together, whereas in the DMC A and B can be two units. So uh, this is one instrument, two units. Now if A and B are two units and uh, the wall is removed, then I think this is a multiple residential units in one instrument. 
Now, Mr. James Ho, I think uh, uh, the more we uh, discuss, uh, the clearer we uh, become. Uh, you have raised a number of technical uh, issues, and I don't think we can go into a cross by cross scrutiny. So I think uh, we really cannot finish this bill within this legislative session. So for amendment number one bill, uh, I will report to the House this Friday, and uh, the second reading debate will be resumed on the 12th of July. And for number two bill, we will uh, revisit it when we uh, reconvene after the uh, summer recess. And then uh, you can have as many rounds of public hearings as you like. Well, there is, uh, I don't want really uh, a lot of uh, public hearings. And uh, legal advisor, do you have any other points to make for our consideration or for the administration's attention? Thank you, Chairman. First, definition of a single residential unit. The uh, English term is unit and a Chinese term is Danwai. Uh, under the stamp duty ordinance, uh, the word unit is used uh, and then uh, in um, mutual trust and uh, Unit trust is used as well. So, uh, can you uh, clarify this? Because uh, the same term has appeared with two different meanings. And for a single residential property, uh, the word used is includes includes A, B, C. So A, B, C are not the only. Cases are regarded as single residential properties. So, can the administration consider other factors and other types or other cases which may also be regarded as a single residential property? Uh, because uh, in uh, Section 29A1, the B A or rather the uh, the collector may determine whether a residential property is a single residential property. So A B C. Uh, the list A, B, C is not exhaustive. In new 1A, the collector may determine whether a residential property is a single residential property, and in making such determination, may have regard to some documents. Now, if the collector determines uh, whether has come to a decision as to whether a residential unit is a single residential property or not will there uh, be uh, an appeal provision here if uh, the buyer is not satisfied with the collector's decision because under 13 and section 47L, uh, only there is only a mechanism uh, for uh, tax appeals. 1A is a new provision. If uh, the uh, payer, the taxpayer, is not satisfied with the decision of the collector. Will there be an, an appeal mechanism, and will it be included in this bill? Yes, please consider uh, the issues raised by our legal advisor. 
Now I'd like to consult the members on the following. There is no need for um, Mr. Toad and I to argue. I wanted to complete the cross by cross scrutiny of the bill today so that we can uh, enact the bill within this session, but now it is impossible. Date of next meeting. The earliest available slot is the 11th of July for a public hearing, but that will be rather rush because we have to issue uh, invitations and wait for responses. So. Uh, this is towards the close of this legislative session, and uh, we uh, usually have uh, three or four meetings lined up for the whole day. Uh, since uh, we cannot do it before the recess, why don't we uh, wait until um, after the recess in October? Yes, I think uh, the I think uh, it's good if the administration can give us. Uh, the uh, responses first. Yes, please follow up with our legal advisor, and we'll just uh, let this uh, loophole go on for a little bit longer, and then we continue with our scrutiny in October. So I'll, re I'll report to the House Committee on the 23rd in relation to the Amendment Bill 2017 uh, for resumption of second reading debate on the 12th of July. That's the uh, first Amendment Bill. For number two bill, we wait until the recess is over. Mr. Holden Chow. So uh, this uh, meeting has identified some um, uh, some unclear areas in the bill. When we come back after the summer recess and meet deputations, uh, can we have um, responses from the administration first? I, I don't think uh, it has to be tabled. I think they should have ample time to prepare the responses for us. All right. If we don't have any OB items, our meeting adjourned.